life wrestling with viruses. Professor Peter Pios has been called the Mick Jagger of microbes. In the mid-70s, he helped to discover Ebola. He went on to lead the global battle with HIV AIDS, founding the UN AIDS Agency. He's now the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Recently, Peter caught and was hospitalised with COVID-19. I spoke to him from his home yesterday, where he's still recuperating, and began by asking whether the virus had finally got its own back. I uh, spent my whole professional career fighting Ebola, uh, HIV, and then finally it got me. Uh, and exactly three months ago, actually, I fell ill with uh, high fever and splitting headache, total exhaustion uh, with the coronavirus and, and got the COVID-19, which then led me to uh, be hospitalized because I, you know, I couldn't make it without uh, oxygen. Many people have, uh, after the acute phase and, and after the virus has been brought under control, uh, have longer-term consequences. In my case, uh, you know, the, my lungs uh, became rigid and uh, there was, as a result of the uh, inflammatory, the hyperimmune response of the body. And, uh, and that caused me for months to be short of breath and so on. And many people have other problems, not only chronic lung problems, but uh, kidney failure. Uh, you know, I had some heart problems. Some people have brain issues and mental health. You talk about the long-term consequences of this disease. Instantly, some people are going to think of Boris Johnson and worry about whether he's fit enough to do such a demanding job. Now, you're not his doctor and you're not going to want to talk about an individual patient, I know. But doing those sorts of hours, is that possible when you've been that ill? It all depends how good of a team you have around you. Um, but uh, it's certainly not exactly the same type of energy that you can put in, in things. But, you know, things are, uh, really improve quite uh, rapidly in some cases uh, and, and not at all in others. So some people will have months and months and months of chronic fatigue. And so I am not familiar with the uh, prime minister's condition, so I don't know uh, and I can't judge at the moment. Let's turn to the global outlook for this pandemic. We heard from the boss of the World Health Organization that it's accelerating the virus around the world. How concerned are you? The good news is that Many countries, including the UK, we've been able to bring down the spread of uh, you know, the virus, a number of new infections and deaths. But the bad news is that the virus has not gone away and it will not go away one fine day. Uh, it is spreading uh, at an increased pace and uh, particularly in the Americas, um, in some uh, North American states, uh, in all over Latin America. Uh, and. Uh, we're soon not going to go to half a million deaths, I'm quite sure. And uh, the number of real um, in infected people in, uh, is probably closer to 20 million than to the official eight and a half million. So no time for complacency. A few weeks ago, the great fear was that the epidemic could spread right across the continent of Africa. Now, you know it well. You were there fighting Ebola in the 70s and then AIDS. Things just turned out to be a little better than we feared. I'd expected by the now uh, Africa would uh, be in the midst of a very serious uh, COVID-19 epidemic. This has not happened yet. Um, and the question is, is that because the population is very young on the average or is it a matter of time? And I think it's rather the latter um, because, first of all, on the anecdotal side, personally, I know four people, four friends who have died um, with COVID-19, one in Ghana, two in uh, Congo, in Central Africa, and one in South Africa. And uh, th that must be the tip of the iceberg. And we also now recently have uh, reports from the Cape, you know, the two Cape provinces around Cape Town, uh, from Kinshasa, from East Africa, that uh, COVID-19 is really starting to fill, you know, the, uh, the hospitals. So it's probably a matter of time. And the challenge for Africa is that you, you can't really apply the same um, methods of social distancing. These are terrible tragedies for the people involved, also for the people of Africa as a whole. But is it also a reminder to us in Europe that even as we get it under control here, there's a danger that the disease is re-imported back from elsewhere? Well, I think the, we don't need to look outside uh, our own borders. I mean, the virus is here. When you see that there are thousands of new infections in, in the UK and, and in uh, nearly all other countries, 
Um, so what is going to happen nearly um, certainly is a so-called second wave of uh, outbreaks. Um, and I don't think and I hope it's not going to be a tsunami, uh, if only because uh, it won't take us by surprise as it has taken our most countries and uh, uh, we know much better what to do. But it will depend on whether um, today everybody, every single individual, uh, follows the, uh, you know, the, the, the guidelines in, the, in terms of social distancing and uh, uh, whether so we can turn um, care homes, whether we can turn the health services, turn slaughterhouses, whether many infections uh, into sa safe places. So probably what we will see is a series of local outbreaks. Um, it doesn't have to be a major uh, second wave or third wave and because this is what will happen. The virus will not disappear one fine day. Forget it. Follow the guidelines, you say, but it looks as if the government are going to amend the guidelines, if not drop that two-metre rule. Does that make you nervous at all? I'm actually uh, not as rigid about this two-metre rule. It, it created actually a sense of, a false sense of security. It's not that suddenly uh, beyond two metres there's no risk. And I'd rather be at one metre um, of someone you know who's infected, but if both of us wear a mask, then at two meters without a mask, uh, you know. And when you look at the countries that have been pretty successful in dealing with this pandemic, um, like um, you know Singapore, um, you know or Hong Kong, uh, Denmark, they follow the World Health Organization rule of one meter. So I'm I'm pretty relaxed as long as it is associated with mandatory. Um, wearing of uh, face masks, of uh, face coverage, in not only in public transport, but also in other public places. I would say in shops and where there are lots of people. We have to adapt to the, the new measures or all these measures to our new uh, environment. But then there are other measures that are completely useless, like quarantine for returning uh, travelers. Um, that only would have made sense at the very beginning, before we have cases when indeed they were imported. Today, that's, that, that's not going to contribute much. And, uh, and it, the damage it causes to the country, to the economy, is going to be enormous. So let's hope that that rule is dropped as soon as possible. And let's concentrate on what works. We've obviously got to prepare for the future as well, the possibility that this is not the last of the great challenges from viruses. Is it your fear that there are more coming and they could even be more serious than coronavirus? You know, people like uh, I have been saying for years that, uh, you know, there will be big epidemics, the big one, uh, you know, a pandemic. Uh, this is one. I always thought it would be an influenza, for a new influenza virus. Now it's a coronavirus, but there will be others. And one of the reasons is that um, these are viruses that come from animals. They jump from an animal in nature, or it can be a wild animal, or it can be chicken. So like is the case uh, for uh, influenza, for the flu, uh, and then, you know, infect people. And, and these, if these are viruses against which we have absolutely no immunity, they will spread and uh, can cause uh, even a worse epidemic than we have now. Um, it will happen, but um, it's like the big one in California, the big earthquake. Will it happen tomorrow? Will it happen in 100 years? Uh, nobody knows. But we must be prepared. There is clearly a job to do to find the origin of this pandemic. Do you take seriously at all the suggestions that it may even have come from a laboratory? Well, a lot of laboratories have already looked into this important question. And uh, when you look at the, the genetic sequence of the virus, which is really the identity profile, and that's unique of every virus, uh, it's clear that it's a virus that uh, was not man-made but, uh, you know, came uh, from some animal, probably a type of bat. And uh, did it go through a lab or not? I mean, I'm not sure that we will ever know, but we know from experience that uh, you don't need a, a lab in the neighborhood to have epidemics with new viruses. I mean, we've seen it, the uh, biggest one since the Spanish flu is HIV. Came up at the end of last century and uh, came out of the blue and, and now we know that the origin was a chimpanzee. Ebola came from, um, you know, from uh, bats also, stars from bats. So I think at the moment, the majority opinion in the scientific community is that this came from uh, wildlife. 
um, directly from bats or through another animal, perhaps through this market, perhaps through other ways, um, uh, we may never know. Now, if you could have a word in the ear of any world leader, who would you choose and what would you say? I doubt that uh, Donald Trump or Xi Jinping would, uh, uh, would listen to what I say. So uh, let's go uh, local. And so I would uh, like to whisper in uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson here, I would say appoint a, um, a Corona, a Covid Tsar uh, at cabinet level, in the cabinet rank, with authority to, to lead the efforts to uh, keep the country safe from uh, COVID-19 for the next few years, because we'll be societies living with COVID, and with authority across all departments, the whole government, and organize some of the, you know, the logistics. This is where we've not done very well. You've been very clear we could be dealing with this for many years to come. Are you warning us that despite all the optimism, all the money, all the dedication, that a vaccine may not actually be found? I'm quite optimistic that we will find a vaccine. And the reason I'm, I'm optimistic is that um, we know already from nature that our body can clear the virus. That is, uh, you know, that means that it is possible to eliminate the virus in a natural way. And that's actually what the vaccine is trying to do. You have to prove that it works. That can take time. It take months and months. So you have to pr make sure that it's absolutely safe. And you have to produce, manufacture, billions and billions of doses, then that can take uh, time and, and, and that uh, the capacity is not there in the world. Um, so it will be 21 before we, we can, we should count on a, on a vaccine to, um, you know, to contain this epidemic. And then my uh, view is that probably we'll still have to continue some other methods. It's not going to be the magic bullet. Uh, because it's unlikely that the first vaccine on the market will be 100% effective. So, but let's hope it uh, reduces uh, severe disease. Uh, it uh, will prevent uh, the virus from uh, from killing us. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, without the vaccine, uh, I think we are in deep trouble. Professor Peter Peel, thank you very much indeed.